Hello, everybody. Here we are. Um, squeaky chair and all. Um, like so many of you, um, I'm sure uh, I just finished watching the, the inauguration take place. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, it was certainly unique from the standpoint of, of the, uh, the way it had to be done safely and social distancing and everything. But it was, uh, you know, it's one of those things, it's so cool when, when I see um, Obama and Clinton and Bush and all, all these guys gathered in a common good, in a common bond. Uh, they're, uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, my fingers are crossed for a better future. This is all I can say is we have now an opportunity to move everything forward in a, in a very positive way. And, and I'm really so deeply hopeful that that's what happens here. I'm, I'm going to do all I can to, uh, to try to keep positive energy going in that direction um, for our future. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, the last a couple of years ago, we did the uh, Kennedy Center Honors, um, where they honored James Taylor, and they put together the section to uh, be the couple of the, pre the presenters for James's award. And it was Craig Durge and myself and Danny Korchmar and Russ Kunkel and Cheryl Crow um, sang on it. And I remember standing in the wings before we, I, I forget, maybe Garth Brooks or somebody was out doing a thing. And I felt somebody bumping into me next to me, just kind of, you know, nudging me slightly. And I turned around and looked and, and it was Bill Clinton. And we started talking and we looked up at the... Uh, at the um, spot up in the center of the balcony where the president would sit, and, and there was Obama sitting there, kind of just rocking along, man. He loves music. And, uh, and we both looked at each other and said, well, that's the end of this. This, <laughs> this ain't going to happen again. And sure enough, as soon as, uh, as, soon as Obama was gone, um, there was all this talk about just canceling them because the contempt for the arts in the previous administration was palpable. And uh, then finally uh, he said you know, he wasn't gonna show up. So they were able to continue with the award show. Um, but it was just unbelievable. When every time I see um, Clinton, I just, I think about that moment and they were just looking at each other going, it's really kind of sad. You know, this is kind of the end of the arts. And it pr certainly proved to be um, the last hurrah. Um, so let's, fingers are crossed for the future. Um, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful and, uh, and, uh, like I said, I'm going to put every bit of energy I can into making things as good as they possibly can be. I know a lot of people are unhappy with the way things are, but, you know, our, our time on this planet is, <laughs> is so limited. I, I find myself sitting here thinking I'm going to be turning 74 soon and, it seems like yesterday was 24, like with just the world ahead of me. And now there's, you know, kind of a finite amount of dates left on that calendar. Um, it goes by so quick and it's so sad to see how much pettiness and rivalry and, and mistrust and contempt and stuff occupies so much energy where it could be the most magical place if people really focused on things that were positive for humanity. And it's not just in the States, it's everywhere. It's a global issue. Um, but uh, so I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. Um, beyond that, I want to thank everybody who uh, was on the live stream yesterday. Um, it was great. I, I, I love the clubhouse. It's just, it's so great. And we've done, I think yesterday was either the 14th or the 15th one we've done since the pandemic began. And it, it's great because, you know, you look at the chat window and recognize almost everybody's names on it. It's the same bunch. It's like this extended family that comes to hang out together. And it's cool. And yesterday was really cool because my, my sister for the first time joined in on it. So I was really glad to see her on there. It was a real kick. And I talked to her afterwards and she was going, oh, I see what you're talking about. This is really amazing and everything. Um, so... Um, Thank you all for that. It was, it really, it always makes my day. I, I so look forward to that. And it just, it's amazing how quickly a couple of hours disappear on you. And, and it's always tough because the time zones, because there's people from New Zealand, 
to Scandinavia, to the UK, to you know Europe on there, plus you know and the states. So you know some people are, are way different time zones, and they hang in as long as they can. Then it's time for dinner and bedtime. So that's a. Uh, but it was great. It was really good. And I was thinking about music for today, and um, something's just been been posted. Um, I was sent the link to it, and I just thought, I'm I'm going to visit this now. This is the, this is in three parts. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and show part one of this um, interview. But um, if you find it intriguing and interesting. Um, just go on, on YouTube. The other um, two parts are, are up there also. I'm just not going to do that long of a, a thing today. We'll be here for, for quite a while because um, this just part one is almost 20 minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll get on with it. But um, but it's, there's a part of a backstory to me I find still blows my mind. Uh, around 1964, I was one of the bands I was in uh, while I was in school. Um, was uh, called we called it was called the John Gross Quartet and John Gross played sax tenor I think on uh, in the band um, Stanley Seal played keyboards and Don Lombardi played drums it was a jazz group I was playing upright in it and we would go down uh, Don's family had a his brother I think had a restaurant in downtown Los Angeles and we would go there and play for food um, but we did a bunch of gigs and stuff I think we played the Lighthouse. Um, and, and, it was, and then eventually, you know, did some gigs and then it, everybody moved their own directions and did what the, their thing. But the weird part was around 1966 or so, um, somehow word came back to me that Don was, I think, on tour in Europe and had been killed in a freak accident, uh, which I found just absolutely horrific. That would have been like one of the very first people I ever knew who died like that of, you know, my age, you know, old people had died, but not anybody young. And um, I carried this with me for some, for so many years. Um, it always would come back to me and I go, it's just unbelievable, you know, losing Don like that. Um, and then a number of years back, I was at the great Louis Belson, the great drummer, Louis Belson. I was at his funeral, um, it was here in Los Angeles, and it was kind of like a who's who of, of musicians in town because Louis was um, so well respected. Um, everybody showed up for the for his funeral, and when it ended, I I started walking out, and Terry Bozio came up to me, who's a good friend, and he said, hey, "Lee, man, you know, we started talking and talking." He says, "Oh, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is Don Lombardi." And it stopped me in my tracks completely. And I looked at him, I said, were we in a band together like back in the 60s? He went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went, and then I told him, I said, all these years, I thought you were dead. And apparently there was some gig he was supposed to be on. Um, and I'm not sure exactly. We talked a little about this, but I guess somebody died on that tour and somehow it came back to me that it was Don, but it wasn't. He wasn't there when this happened. Um, it's just crazy. But And then come to find out that he is DW Drums. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, every guy I knew was using DW Drums. And here, I, I thought the guy's dead. And he's got one of the biggest drum companies in the world, most respected drum companies. And uh, so it, it was amazing that this all happened. And then... Um, We've, talk, we've talked since then, and our paths crossed. And, uh, and then when it came time for us to do a, a, our second live stream, the first one we did down at the Coach House, uh, and then when we did the second live stream, um, Don was kind enough to let us use their facilities out there. And uh, one of the things that we did was we filmed our video, and then when the video was, we finished filming, um, and we did, this was during COVID. I mean, everybody was, you know, the crew, band, everybody had masks and distance, you know, except for the performance moments. And that's when the, the band unmasked. Um, and then we uh, got together and did a, a band interview with Don. And then after that was over, Russ and I stayed on um, 
and on opposite ends of a couple of couches and Don in the middle. And he interviewed us. And I, um, I have not heard this yet. Um, I just got the link to it. So I thought I would check this out with you and see if we made any sense or not. Um, but this is part one, and this is for, for DW Drums has the drum channel. I mean, they're, they're, they're um, kind of the scope of what they do is, is really big. And um, I, I did a, a video a while back um, on there that was kind of done giving a little uh, a, a, a short tour of the DW factory, showing them making drums and stuff. And I just found it all so fascinating. I love that kind of stuff. So it was cool. But um, let's just check this out and see see what the hell we were talking about here. And, uh, and again, it's a remarkable day in our history. A quantum change has taken place. And um, fingers are crossed. No fingers today. It's, the, it's this one for a far better future for everyone. So... Here we go, our DW drums, me, Russ Kunkel, and Don Lombardi. A little wadding gets started here. This is us playing Cruel Twist. Welcome to another interview here on Drum Channel. This is a really, really special occasion for me. We not only have a legendary drummer, we have a legendary bass player, which is the heart of a band. The rest of the band is gone now, so we can say that's the heart of the band. We know that. Without us, they're nothing. Right, right. And I'll introduce him to my left first, Lee Scalar, dear friend uh, for many, many years, Boy. going back to our teenage years, uh, which is a few years ago, to say the least. Russ Kunkel to my right. And, and they are uh, the heartbeat of the immediate family, mm -hmm. which I'm secretly hoping they do a, a 23 and me, and maybe I'm back in there somewhere, and they're, <laughs> maybe I'd be a great uncle or something. You back, already are. Back in you there. You have are. a place of honor in our family. Uh, Absolutely. Their discographies for you young drummers out there, musicians, is, is amazing. If we were to go through it and you were to print it out, you would have to, you know, at least plant a half dozen trees each, I would think. Uh, drummers usually are going to get gigs when I talk to them, referred to by the bass player in the band. That happens often, mm -hmm. more times than not. Mm -hmm. uh, and vice versa too, I'm sure. If yeah. they're looking for a bass player, they'll go to the drummer. Because if you're in the lead of the band, you want to have that going on behind you. pocket. Uh, young drummers hear that a lot. How would you, you know, if not define it, how do you look at what that means? If, if a young drummer's in a band and just they just would say, hey, you, could you, it's not necessarily that you're not rushing or dragging, which is something else I want to talk to you gentlemen yeah. about, but uh, just pocket in general. What would you say is a way to practice to experience that? Or Well, it, this, is, this is a very difficult question, Don, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer to the best of my understanding. You know, um, the, the, the actual making of a beat, like taking a stick or your hand and hitting something, a lot happens between here and there. You know, how fast you go down, you know, with, with, with what degree that you're hitting it. You know, I think pocket is created by the things that are done or not done in between the beats. And, and they can be, like someone pointed out to me in a video that I did the other day, that my left hand, I'm constantly letting go of the stick. I'm like, I'm constantly moving, letting go of, of the whole thing as I'm playing. And so what happens, all, all the little skips and the little in-between beats become part of the groove, and they're totally unconscious for me. I'm not consciously doing them at all. It's, my, it's the, how my body will play that groove. And my right hand does it a little bit different than my left hand, and my feet are, are separate too. But I think groove comes from those things that are played or not played in between the actual notes, you know, the, you know, the hard notes that you're hitting, whether the chord notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes. I think it's all the stuff in between. And that's where swing comes from. And, that, and that's how, you know, a, a, straight, a, a straight beat is, is very simple to show, 
but to, to, to take that same beat and swing it, that has to happen with all the other stuff, you know, so. Well, brings up lessons we have on Drone Channel. Technically, learn how to play with your fingers, open and close them, be relaxed when you hit the drums. Those are things that you're talking about that happen. You don't think about it when it's happening. It no, just becomes about it. And it's a great definition of pocket. That's the idea of like, if the drums weren't there, it's the feeling and the motion of your time. Yeah. And of your body. Of your body Your too. body has to create that pocket. Yeah. Like, perfect example, just watch Bernard Purdy play drums. He's dancing when he's playing the drums, you know? He's, he's just poetry. This to me is like one of the most profound moments I've felt in a long time with you saying what you're saying, because people have been commenting on my channel saying, we're fascinated watching your right hand, it's like you're conducting yourself. Because they said, we're watching you play, but sometimes when you're, when you're not actually hitting notes, your fingers are doing other things. And I'm going, what are you talking about? Sorry about the phone. And it's completely unconscious, but I'm constantly in my mind subdividing and thinking about parts, even if I'm not actually physically playing notes at that point, my hand is still responding, you know, kind of filling the space. I watch you do that all the time. You actually do conduct yourself. You, you'll play and you'll go, yeah, but I'm not aware I of know, any I know, but it's, it's, you're, you're filling this yeah. with, with movement as opposed to not moving at all. Yeah. You're staying in the flow of that groove. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of, and, and, and a lot of times for me, when I'm hearing a song while I'm playing it, it might be just a uh, uh, something like that, but in my mind, I'm hearing. Exactly. I'm I've got this other pulse that's far more involved in it. But what happens is when you've got those little beats going, it gives you options of where you want to settle on it. So you could be sitting right behind the beat, right on the top of it, or but having that pulse in your head really lets you fall into the space rather than thinking. You know, you know those subdivisions. What they're giving you, they're giving you places to jump to jump off from mm -hmm. and to land on. Because if you're hearing them, you, it's not like it's not like you're trying to hit one certain spot. Yeah. You're hearing all the individual ones. And you yeah. go, I'm just going to go do 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 do. You know, yeah, it's interesting, but it's it's so great to hear your description of that with your hand, how it's cutting loose, because that's kind of exactly what I'm doing yeah. on it. But we've never even discussed this before, but it's interesting that this I'm is amazed. an observation people I'm are making. I'm amazed that I don't drop sticks all the time. <laughs> well, so many great drummers are so loose when they play. That is, that is, that's why you're not having carpal tunnel issues, or yeah. you're, you're, you can look like you're hitting hard, but still be very, very relaxed. That's what I always loved with Jim Kelton. I would step back like a, he looks like he's dealing canasta. <laughs> he's sitting back there just like, you know, this thing, and you go, and you listen, and you go, like, guys, like, on it, but if you look, it's like you're not getting that impression. What you're hearing doesn't... The drums get in the way yeah. <laughs> and produce a sound. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean. A slower, we've said this often on drum channels, slow songs are more difficult for drummers to play than, than fast songs because you have that space that you have in yeah. between. Peter Erskine gave us a, a tip early on when one of the lessons he did when uh, he played Killer Joe with the band and just played it thinking of the quarter note on the cymbal. And then he subdivided it, so while he played that, he had the drummer, he had some drummers come up, do a chick in between, and it changed the feel of that all of a sudden, yeah. just by hearing that extra lump into that space. Um, Mick Fleetwood also told a, an interesting story you guys would enjoy. Um, I asked him about groove and time and pocket, and I thought I would get a, a, a orchestrated answer about you know, how I grew over a period of time and all this. And he said it's something that he absolutely had to develop. He said he was in a, a cover band for a club and they brought a fairly well-known blues artist in and it was the first time they had played in front of a kind of a major person. And at the end of the first song, the blues artist turned around and just reamed the band and him too. He said, you're not watching me. You're not seeing how I'm moving my, not even listening to him, just how I'm moving my body motion to see yeah. what I'm doing. So, and when you watch Mick, it is interesting because he tends to look around. And I always thought it was just, a, he said, no, I'm watching everybody. You know, if, if I, if I got to see that they're dancing, the bandmates have to be dancing, I want to be sure the guy, if not, I say to myself, Mick, you got to bring it in. <laughs> it's so, really true. It's so, absolutely true. Yeah. It's like if you watch Ray Charles at the piano. I mean, he's not just tapping time, he's conducting. His body is giving that the band explicit instructions as to where he's going. And, the angle of his leg while he's playing, while he's tapping his foot. I mean, it's, if you really focus on that, you really see 
what he's bringing to the band and yeah, uh, his direction. At this point in both your careers for many, many years, uh, going way back, you're, you're at a level that we kind of talk about where there's musicians who are good and qualified because they have the skills of doing what they're doing. So if you need a drummer, you would call that drummer. And there's sometimes you want a drummer that sounds like somebody, and so you get somebody who's good enough who can kind of fill that void. And then, as has been true with your careers, they want you because yeah. they know what they're, they're going to get. Um, when you hit that point in your career, was, was it, and I'll ask you first, uh, well, did you feel more of a freedom when you went in to, to a session where you knew they, uh, you were going to contribute more to what was going on? They were looking for you to be more a part of the project. Uh, I know Jim in recent years, is he's going to do what he wants to do, he's, yeah. he kind of, which is he's earned that right, and they should know what they're going to get when they call him in the first place, and it couldn't <laughs> yeah, get any better. Exactly. Uh, but uh, was there a point in your career where you, you felt that you kind of came to age as far as that goes? Um, I, think, I don't think I've reached that point yet, Don. We have to have a conversation <laughs> with him. We think he has. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, for my whole career, anytime someone would call me and be willing to pay me good money to come and, and play music, play their music, I was just so grateful to have a job. You know, and so uh, my only goal into going in that session was to give the, you know, find out what's needed and wanted and produce and present it, you know, just because all I wanted is for them to call me back. Sure. You know, just to, to, don't not call me back. So, so I think that I, I've carried that attitude with me my whole career. But you produce and do the whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and mo most of the people that we've worked with uh, abundantly over the years, like a perfect example, Peter Asher, you know, he would really rely on us to, to bring yeah. what we would bring to the sessions, you know, and, and play it the way that we would play it, you know, because that's, we'd have so much experience together with him. So to answer your question, yes, you know, I, I think we're given a little bit more leeway once we arrived at that, at that place in our careers, for sure. Same experience. Well, it's it's a funny thing to me. It, it runs a whole gamut. I, I I always get a kick out of it when somebody says, especially nowadays, uh, when we were getting started. Generally, when you go to a session like with a James Taylor, Jackson Brown, the artists would sit down with their guitar or at the piano, and that was all they did was play that. And then we would sketch out a little chart or something like that. As compared to showing up now and somebody's just spent eight months doing home demos and they've come in with all their parts cemented in their mind. But I love it when somebody says to me, I, I channeled you when I did this. I've, uh, this is uh, all I could think of what you're going to play. And then they play me the demo and I go, not in a million years would I have ever played that part. But I can't say that to them because they're sitting there like they've given birth to you. <laughs> and uh, It's funny, but yeah, there, there's a lot of times where um, at this point we, we have a history that people draw from. And so there's an expectation when they hire you that you're gonna bring that history and they're gonna hear that kind of stuff that they're used to. And, and, and that's fine, but I'll tell you, there's nothing that pleases me more than when somebody comes in with their own ideas because it broadens my horizon on it too because I might hear them do something. I go, God, I wouldn't have thought of that, but that's a great idea. So it really is a bit of a dance that, that you go through. And I kind of appreciate all of it. But I've always been insecure. I mean, I'm, I'm like one of these kind of self-deprecating people about my playing. And I always I have a kind of a mantra, like when I'm driving to a session, I kind of go, please don't suck. You know, just <laughs> do a good job. <laughs> it's, okay, yeah, you know, you know, that's why he gets along with I drummers to, so well. I have, to, I have to say something about Lehman right now with regards to what he just mentioned. It doesn't matter. He could have played the most perfect take. And I've heard him play perfect takes. And we'll go into the control room and every single time he'll go, just give me another track. Yeah, <laughs> it, I'm it'll, be, it'll be a flawless performance. Guilty. And as soon as we listen to the playback, he goes, let me just go out there, just give me another track. I'm going to do one more. <laughs> and of course, it's equally as brilliant, you know. But he, he's, it's really true. He's really like that. He just, you know, he... Well, I, I started home recording in this pandemic. I got sent a, a, an interface, so I started doing it. So these 
people have been sending me tracks and they go, you know, so just send me back a bass part. And I send them back like nine tracks. <laughs> of course and you I go, do. <laughs> you know, you go through this and pick what you want or do a comp, I don't care. But I sit, because I don't know the process enough to punch. So I'm like doing top to bottom performances and I might like do a whole one and then miss a little note somewhere. So I do it again. <laughs> Rather than thinking, I could just run a whole track and just do that section. So I'm learning. But it's one of these things. They, they keep going, you're sending us too much information and stuff. But for me, I get real neurotic about it because I want it to be something really... When you put your signature on something, you want to step away from it as proud as you can be. And it doesn't matter what the project is. It could be with the biggest artist in the world or somebody who's never going to be heard. It's a vanity project or something like that. But... When you, when you commit to it, you want to do the best job you can. And so I become like really hypercritical about myself. You know, they're, they're happy with the first take, but I'm always going. Yeah, no, You're praying just, they don't come back and say, which one did you like the best? Well, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 could, it could back up on me really fast. I love John's so, life. Thing, He's such a good about kid. Ruin, that's so amazing. And I'm, and I'm sure lots of other musicians too. But, you know, if, if a, a new artist wants Leland to come out and play live with him, and he sends him tape of all the songs that are going to be in the show, he'll memorize them, every single one of them. And he'll come up on the bandstand, no, no charts, no nothing, and he'll play them top to bottom perfectly. Wow. And, uh, you know, and that's, you know, he, that's, that's who he is. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be looking at a piece of paper. He wants to be making sure he does the dance floor. Make it come, yeah. all, make it come well, alive. It, it's funny, like when I'd be on the road... Um, like I toured for years with a, an artist, Veronique Sanson, French. She was married to Stephen Stills back in the 70s. Um, she's great, fabulous artist. And like we would be at gigs and, and I would be sitting in the dressing room with headphones on working on songs. And the other guys were all jerking around and having fun. And they'd always come in. They'd go, how come you're like always in here doing this? I said, because there's really only one guy on that stage that needs to know what the downbeat is. I said, it's me. I said, drums, you can hit anything and it'll still be musical. It may not be the correct part, but, you know, if it's supposed to be a, a floor tom and you hit an upper tom or something, it, nobody's going to know. Guitar player, keyboard player, they can, they can wait if they're not quite sure what's going on. I've got to be there for the downbeat. So, like, I get really anal about learning material. And if I ever start with a chart, it's almost like heroin. I can't get away from it. Um, it, it becomes a crutch really fast. So for me, it's like when I went out with the first time I toured with Toto, I had five days to learn their show. And we were, and then we were heading straight to the Dubai Jazz Festival. And I just immersed myself in it and sat around the clock playing these songs over and over and over, driving around, listening to them uh, in my car. And, um, and with Lyle, we found this, like Lyle Lovett would call us, like we, I think we did a Lasix convention down in Florida, and he sends me like 35, 40 songs to learn for the show. And it's a one-off. But I think, you know, there's no way for me to hide at a music stand where I'm standing. And to me, when you're looking, standing up there looking at a chart, you look like hired help. And mm. so I just commit them all to memory. And that may be the only time I ever play those songs. But I want to be engaged. I want to you know, be making eye contact with the band and the artist and the audience and not be glued to a piece of paper, so. The message we give young drummers, I think it all kind of comes under be prepared. Yeah, it will, ultimately, that's what it's about. I mean, there's so many things that come with that. Um, it, it's it's like I always tell guys, because I end up, I do a few master classes in clinics, and I always just go, look, if it's a 10 a.m. downbeat as a bass player, you're there at 9.30, your gear's in place, you're tuned, you've, if there's charts, you've gone through the charts to see if there's any surprises. Now at 10 a.m., you have to be ready to play. Now the artist might be two hours late. Anything can be, happen. That's on them. But my job is to treat this as a profession. There's an element of it that, that it's called playing, but it's not playing. It's, this isn't like going to the, you know, the, the jungle gym and so. This is a serious profession, and you really have to treat it that way and really dedicate yourself to it. Yeah, absolutely. And then it's joyous. When you've got all that behind you, then you can go in and just go and for it. And you've got a black t-shirt. When I woke and I Slipping and sliding again. Why am I slipping? 
Hi, I'm Leland Sklar, and we are the immediate family. I'd like to introduce the fellas to you. Next to me is Stephen Postel on guitar vocals, Danny Korchmar, guitar vocal, Wadi Wachtel, guitar vocal, and Russell Kunkel on drums. Make sure this doesn't come up again. Good. <laughs> I don't know, all this stuff going on here. Um, get rid of this. Let me just get rid of that. There we go. And there's the hot rod. Um, so there's, that's part one. So we did three parts. So two and three are available uh, on YouTube and probably on the drum channel also. Uh, but it's really, it was just really fun just to sit with Russ and Don. You know, everybody was gone. It was just three of us sitting there with a, you know, I think two guys were holding cameras you know, a distance away. Um, but it's, it's like when Russ was talking about his, you know, letting go of the stick, you know, and doing that stuff. It, it's first time, I mean, I've been playing with the guy for 50 years plus. And it's the first time I ever heard him describe that. So it was, for me, it was a real nice learning experience, too. And, uh, but I love the guys, you know, to, it, it's a remarkable opportunity to be in a band, um, working with guys for over a half a century and have never had an argument, a fight. I mean, we have serious discussions about material, about gigs and touring and all, but it's never, I've heard about, you know, you hear of so many bands that just are always at each other's throats. They don't travel together. They don't like each other. It's strictly business. Get out there and do your gigs. We are so not like that. I mean, this is really a brotherhood and an immediate family. And then as Cooch named us, um, it was really aptly, aptly put. So I'm going to get going right now. I got to drop some books at the post office and do a couple of other errands. And, uh, and then I'll get back and take care of some other stuff. And, um, uh, and just kind of relish in a unique day in American history and, um, and keep my fingers crossed for a, a, a much better future for everyone. So let's hope. And, uh, and not let up our guard for one second because, uh, you know, the pandemic is, is still roaring along and hopefully this, uh, this new administration and their team will help get this thing on track for getting out the uh, the vaccines, and uh, I'm still waiting to find an opportunity to get mine. I'm still not in an area where they're um, where they've brought them in yet. They're still doing healthcare workers and teachers and 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 those who are really in contact with the uh, public on a, on a constant basis. And so for that, I'm I'm happy to give up my place in line at this point and let those people who are really putting themselves in harm's way. Um, get these first shots. Uh, I, I have control over my situation. I cannot go out, so they don't have that luxury. So, my heart's with all of them, and my heart's with all of us. Let's just let's just enjoy a better, kinder, safer world. And uh, and I'll see you all tomorrow. So, and maybe I'll go out and play around with the car. I will get to that. I promise you. So, okay, take care. Bye bye.